Well, he hey, well, hey, what's going on? So, uh, people of Boundary Break know exactly what my channel is all about, and I figure we can do something a little bit different this time around. Instead of boundary breaking software, how about we boundary break hardware? See, every single game cartridge and every single game console has guts to it. It has something on the inside that helps a game operate. And I think that that whole world is very fascinating, but also kind of outside of my reach. I don't quite understand how it all works. Um, you could take a look on Google to get some explanations, but they kind of over explain everything. So the purpose of this video is going to give a very basic introduction and a ba very basic understanding of what it is you're looking at when you open up a game cartridge or a game console. And I figure we can start off by doing just Nintendo consoles and seeing what we can find and see if this just turns out to be an interesting video. So join me if you will. Oh boy. Okay. Well, I will never say that again. How about we just get started on a classic, The Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo Entertainment System and work from there. So first things first, we gotta talk about how Nintendo tries to keep you out of Nintendo cartridges and other Nintendo hardware as well. You might notice that on the back of an NES cartridge, the screws don't quite match up with a Phillips head or a flathead. And that's because Nintendo uses special screws to keep normal folks like us out of it. However, with the advent of the internet, you could buy the appropriate screw bit to open up any of your NES games, which if you want, I can leave a link to one of them in the video description. But because I've watched enough cooking shows in my lifetime and I know how to save you, the viewer, a little bit of time on your end, I went ahead and removed all the screws already. And if we open it up, we can see what's inside. And right off the bat, I think the first thing you're gonna notice is how tiny this thing is in comparison to the cartridge. Because you see, over in Japan, they have Famicom carts, which is the original design. I happen to have one right here and I can open it up for you and show you what it looks like inside of that. And as you can see, even though they look very different on the outside, on the inside, it looks very similar. All right, well, let's take a look at the circuit board now. So over on the left here, the first thing you're gonna notice is the circular battery. And I think this is probably the most universally known thing. If you have a Nintendo Entertainment System game that uses save files, they all have a battery to back that data up. Now over in the corner here is really cool. So what you got is the year and the Nintendo logo laser etched into the board, as well as the serial number of the game itself. Now, if there was only one version of the game, every single board should have the same serial number in the corner here. However, if there was ever a re-release or an updated version, that serial number will look completely different. But if you're a collector, knowing this number in the top here is very important. Now let's start talking about all the chips. This is something I was really excited to explain because how many of us have looked at a circuit board and had no idea what you were looking at? Well, as you can see here, there are five chips on the board. And although there are seven variants to the NES cartridge, let's explain what's going on with The Legend of Zelda. So at the very top here, we have the memory management controller. Now, if you haven't read up on this stuff already, all of these names don't really mean much to you, but what the MMC chip does is that it handles the save data from A Legend of Zelda and also handles the multi-directional screen scrolling that you see in the game. Now, let me flip this around so you can read all the stuff on the chips. And this little guy is the checking integrated circuit. Very complicated name, but it's not a very complicated idea. This is just the lockout chip. What it does is something we're all very familiar with. It's the chip used to communicate with the Nintendo Entertainment entertainment system to let it know you have a US NES video game inside of a US system. Hello and welcome to Region Locked. Now let's move on to this chip that's branded by Sharp, and the name of this chip is a Program Random Access Memory Chip. Though funny enough, this is the chip that needs that battery because it rewrites data all the time. And all this chip does is hold additional data for the chip right above it, which we'll get to in one second so we can talk about this Sony chip, which I assume is a relationship with Nintendo that I think is now defunct. Just a guess. But what this chip does is that it's the Character Random Access Memory. And in the most simplest of terms, what it does is it contains all the text and graphics that you see in a Nintendo game. In fact, if you wanted to see the contents of a CHR RAM chip, it would look something like this, as the graphics for the NES games get assembled later. And in some rare cases, you can find unused graphics on this chip, which would be the source of a lot of great discoveries that you see on websites like The Cutting Room Floor. And anyways, over on to the last chip. This is the program read-only memory. And this chip is particularly important because it handles all the game's code and operations. This chip will communicate with the computer processing unit of a game console, allowing for a lot of what you see to work. Now, before we start moving on from NES games and start talking about the system itself, there's one little thing that always bothered me as a little kid. So sometimes you have a game that makes a rattle noise. 
There we go. Now the rattle noise is usually due to dropping the game, and you'll see why in a second. Now you'll swear up and down sometimes that you did not drop your game ever, and I don't believe you. But if you look inside this cartridge, you'll find a dead bug. That's pretty gross. But over to the right of the dead bug is the culprit of the most common NES rattle. And the reason this exists inside your cartridge is that it once held the circuit board in place. You can even see the matching piece on the right here. And this is what tends to happen with the games that you own, is that one will keep it held up while one on another side is just rattling around. And there you go, mystery solved. Well, shoot, I think I might have pulled the trigger a little bit early there, because a second ago I said that we were going to look at the NES system. We still are, but there is one more accessory for the NES that we can't overlook, and that is, of course, the NES Zapper. Here's a little bit of nostalgic brain food for you. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. So as far as zappers go, we are working with the bad boy version. As you can see here on the box, they later had to revise it to look more kid friendly, so it couldn't be confused for something real. In fact, if you were to move the top layer of this device, it only serves to help its case even less. And all right, now the first thing I noticed, of course, is that there's even more screws to remove. This is not gonna be an easy thing to reassemble for the record, so if you choose to do this yourself, uh, you've been warned. And the next thing that's catching my eye here is this giant cylinder of brass. And this is really cool. This is just extra weight added to the zapper to give it more heft. And it's not even the only place that has extra weight in this peripheral. As over in the front, we got really old scotch tape. This is like 30 year old scotch tape. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in King Tut's tomb right now. But beyond the scotch tape is another cylinder that's hollow bodied. And the reason why it has to be hollow bodied is so that the mechanism inside the zapper can see through it. Okay, so there's 5,000 things in this mechanism alone just to explain how it all works. First, you got this spring here that allows the trigger to go back into place so you can press it in again. Then you got this spring here that allows this little white part of the mechanism to also spring back into place. And the springy sound that you always hear when you pull the trigger on a zapper is coming from this spring over here, which retracts the white mechanism on top back into its original position. But all of this is to move this white contraption to push this one button over here to communicate with the circuit board. Oh, something just flew off. What was that? <laughs> I just lost the spring. All right, guys, here we go. The godfather of gaming itself, the NES console. First thing you end up seeing when you open it up is the cradle that houses the cart itself. And all the way in the back is what causes a lot of grief for a lot of players, which is the 72 pin connector. See, with this device, there are 36 pins on the top and 36 pins on the bottom that kind of squeeze and hug the circuit board of the NES game that you put inside of it. And once it makes contact, it communicates with the system itself, all of which is upside down. Here we go, if we flip it around, I can show you what's going on here. Now there are a lot more chips here and there's a lot more to cover in this video, so I won't be going over everything. But I'll explain what I think is the two most interesting. Over on the left here, the bigger chip is the computer processing unit, which means that this is the main processor, of course, but this chip also processes the audio, so you can hear those sweet chip tunes. And over on the right is the picture processing unit, which handles all the processes of the graphics. And not only that, this unit also creates the TV signal. So yeah, have you guys ever heard of the Super FX chip? National graphics and blazing game speed. An only game powered by the Super FX microchip. Stunt Race FX with the Super FX chip for multi-dimensional visual weirdnessity. Only on the Super NES. Yeah, it was like this huge marketing campaign for the Super Nintendo that boasted 3D graphics on its 2D system. In fact, on these cartridges that sport the Super FX chip, they have this little label. I don't know if you can see it on each one that features it. And obviously, if it's a chip inside the cartridge, we should take a look at it, right? Um, I mean, they talk about it all the time, so why don't we open these up and see what it looks like. All right, Super effects chip in the flesh, here we go. What? Profound sadness. Those those are the two words that come to mind here. So what's going on? Where are the chips? Well, it's supremely ironic to admit, but a video game that is the spearhead for a special chip has no chips in it at all. At least in the version that I'm showing you right now. What you're looking at here are EEPROMs that are not in a chip. And when an EEPROM is not in a chip, they use the material that you're looking at right now called epoxy resin, which starts off in a thick, goopy form and then hardens into what you see now. But thankfully, all these EEPROMs are labeled, and so the second EEPROM from the left 
is where the Super FX chip should be, only here it's called the Mario Chip 1, which turned out to be a code name for the Super FX chip before it was the Super FX chip. This is evidenced by the fact that above that it says A slash N Inc, which stands for Argonauts and Nintendo Incorporated, which Argonaut Software is the development team behind the Super FX chip. But no worries, like I showed you earlier, we have two games that have the Super FX chip, so let's test our luck with Stunt Race FX, also known as the little game that could. Happy to finally give this game a little bit of time to shine because here we go. We are now looking at a bona fide Super FX chip, which also features the charming little logo on the chip itself. Okay, so a lot of people on Twitter are asking me to do the Virtual Boy, and I think the troll here was that because it costs so much money to own one of these things, it would be stupid to open up one of these things. Well, thankfully, um, I already tried to open up one like years ago to fix it and failed. But through my failure, I learned a lot of things about it. So how about we get started and show you some really cool stuff with that. All right, so first we just need to remove this back panel here and uh, you know what? All things considered, this guy's in pretty good shape. Oh, all right, well, like that fell off. So first of all, the big thing you need to know is that the Virtual Boy's biggest flaw is that the game sends information through ribbon cables, and then the ribbon cables travel into two screens, one for each eye. Now what makes the ribbon cable flawed is that it's held together by glue, and for a lot of Virtual Boy owners that glue depreciates over time, or even came out of the box in poor shape on its heyday. And so there's various solutions to reheat the glue and reapply it to the board. But like I said, I already ruined this one, so we won't be doing that. Instead, let me show you what else is going on here. So just like I said two seconds ago, there are two screens on each side to create two images just like it does for the 3DS. Now these individual screens, however, do not face your eyes directly like you would imagine. Instead, the images are reflected off of these mirrors. And these mirrors are what your eyes will see for the majority of the time. So naturally, when you're making a video like this, you have to ask yourself a very basic question, and that is, what would you have opened up if you were a kid? And I remember way back when, I always thought that the Rumble Pack was really interesting. This is the Rumble Pack. It's designed with a force feedback device that lets players feel the game. And the fact that it rumbled was uh, really new technology at the time, and I really wanted to know how it worked. So, of course, we're gonna look at that. We're also gonna look at one of these, and also a couple of, well, I can't reach it. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna look at games as well. Right away when you open up the rumble pack you'll see the circuit board on the right and at a glance you might be confused as to where the rumble comes from. However, the rumble pack does wear its tech right on its sleeve. As you'll see by removing this black circular object, the rumble is a half circle of brass that receives signals from the circuit board to determine the time and velocity in which this object spins. In fact, I have no problem seeing it in motion while playing Super Smash Bros. Here you can see for yourself the one-to-one -one communication with things like throwing the boomerang or getting hit by an object or jumping off a cliff for science. For the Nintendo 64 controller, I chose the most disgusting but disposable controller that I could find. And when you open it up, there's a couple of shocking revelations here. Personally, I was hoping that the circuit board would have just about the same shape as the controller itself. But that's not the case. The circuit board looks more like a Super Nintendo controller, with the analog stick kind of being its own thing and wiring up to the board. And opening up the analog stick is something else. You can see that underneath everything, there's like a trap for all the grounded up plastic, which without a doubt was mostly accumulated by playing Mario Party. And one really cool thing about this board here is that it labels where all the buttons are. So you got your up, down, left, right, start, C buttons, everything is properly labeled. Okay, so we got three games on the table right now, and the first one that we want to look at is Majora's Mask. And this is just so you can get a little bit of a tour of what it looks like inside of a game cartridge on the N64 that isn't from some lame golf game. And when you open it up, you can see that there's a metal plating on both the front and the back of the cartridge, which is not something you would have seen from the other generations of Nintendo games, which made it a little bit of a shock to me when I opened it up. But enough about that, why do we want to look at these other two games? Well, one is a game that I don't care about whatsoever, the other is a Japanese import of Animal Crossing. I'm sure a lot of you Nintendo Hardcore already knew this, but Animal Crossing in fact got its start on the N64 before later coming overseas on the GameCube. Now here's the problem, N64 games are region locked. 
because the grooves on the back of the Japanese cart are different from the grooves on the back of the US cart. But here's the ridiculously easy solution. You remove the back panel from a game you don't care about and you screw it onto the back of the Japanese game that you do care about. It's seriously that simple. And now when you put this beautiful import cart into your Nintendo 64, we got ourselves some first gen Animal Crossing. Uh, wow, this video is actually going on pretty long, so pretty excited about that. Um, but I'm not done just yet. I want to talk about the uh, Nintendo GameCube, and then we'll move on to one more thing after that. So because this is such a small system, but more advanced than something like the Nintendo 64, it means that more stuff has to be crammed inside of this thing with even less space. So it's really, really impressive that a device like this can be properly ventilated and hold up spec wise to something like PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox. But of course, that means if you're gonna be taking something like this apart, there's going to be a lot of screws involved and some really clever methods of keeping it all together. Naturally, I don't recommend taking this apart, especially because the GameCube uses things that are held together by adhesive. Like for example, this heat sink. And to anyone who's never assembled a computer before, a heat sink is a metal device that usually sits on top of a processor, which then absorbs all the heat from that processor and allows it to be ventilated properly. And the sacrifice I'm gonna be making for this review is I'm going to remove this heat sink so that we can look at the processor. And the code name for the Nintendo GameCube was the Dolphin. And throughout the GameCube's lifespan, there was various nods to that with various Dolphin related Easter eggs. But none is more hidden than the one on the system itself, because like I said, when you remove that heatsink, you can see that the processor has the code name Flipper on it. And Flipper, if you're not a historian or if you're not old enough to remember, was a very famous TV dolphin. Well, shucks. I didn't want this video to end, but uh, you know, it's not a feature length film, it's a YouTube video. I don't want you guys to get bored. Um, so why don't we wrap this up with a cool Easter egg that I found in recent Nintendo hardware. That's right, something for the Nintendo Switch. How about it? Now, I hate that I have to do this, but I stripped away one of the most important screws to get this thing loose. And so in order to show you what's inside this controller, I have to break it open. But why are we looking in the Switch Pro Controller? Well, for the majority of this video, the focus has been on circuit boards. And I think one of the best circuit board Easter eggs that Nintendo has ever left behind is right here on this controller. Now, by pulling down on the right analog stick and showing it under the correct light, you could see this for yourself, which is my way of saying, don't do what I just did. But as you can see, every single Switch Pro controller has a special little message lasered into the board, which says thanks to all game fans. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was something kind of different from what I usually do on this channel. A new Boundary Break episode will definitely be the next one that I put out for fans that have been keeping up with the channel. So don't worry, I'm not going crazy over here. Uh, it's not gonna be all new stuff. Um, I just like to experiment once in a while. But if you're new to this channel, let me tell you about this series that I usually do. It's called Boundary Break. And then we can take the camera basically anywhere in hopes of finding new discoveries or just showing off developer techniques that are off screen. So if you've never heard of it before, I highly recommend you check it out. And um, outside of that, I just really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, just let me know. And of course, if you wanna see another video like this, just let me know what hardware you'd like to see and I'll definitely do my best to feature it. But all right guys, I'll see you later. Bye.